Well, today is the final week of our series entitled... Today is the final week of our series entitled... There you go. It's kind of cheating. It's on the back wall, right? Hope is here. I'll tell you, it's been so encouraging to gather as a church and uncover all the ways that we find hope in our relationship with Jesus Christ and our relationships with one another. So just kind of a brief recap, okay? If you remember back to week one, we learned that there is hope for the weary because we don't have to carry our burdens alone. The second week, we discovered that there is hope for the broken because forgiveness is offered to us in the love of Jesus Christ. And then last week, the third week, we recognized that there is hope for the underdog, right? You guys remember the underdog clip? Uh, I watched that three more times this week. I'm telling you, I just love that underdog intro, right? But we know there's hope for the underdog because with God, we can do anything. Now, if you missed any one of these weeks and you would like to get caught up in what's going on, I want to encourage you to go to our YouTube page. Just, just go to YouTube, search for East Cross United Methodist Church. It's going to pop up. And if you like it, Every time that we post a new video or a sermon series or something like that, it's going to just notify you, and you'll know that that's coming up. Okay, so you can always go to YouTube to get caught up. Um, and, and I'll tell you, if, if anything that you have missed over the last four years, it's on there. Okay, so it gives you plenty of time throughout the week. And once again, when you say there's nothing on TV, there's always something. Okay, you can always go. And this week, we're hoping that all of our likes and views go through the roof because we're just hoping. Okay, we're just hoping, right? So this week, we're going to continue on in our sermon series as we deal with one of the hardest places, I think, for many people to find hope, and that is the midst of our doubts, right? It's hard to find hope in the midst of our doubts, and over the next few minutes, we're going to seek to answer the question, is there hope for the doubter? Is there hope for the doubter? But before we get into it this morning, let's pause for a moment of prayer, asking for God to speak to our hearts. Let's pray. Holy God, we come to this time in the service, Lord, where we just, we pause and we, we kind of just shut everything out so that we can truly focus on your word for us today. God, we ask that you would speak, that you would write your word upon our heart so, God, that it may just not be knowledge, but instead it moves to wisdom and that wisdom moves us to action. So, God, we thank you for your presence in this place. We thank you, God, that you are a God who still speaks each and every moment of the day. All we have to do is listen. So, God, this morning your servants are listening. In your son's name we pray. And the church said, amen. So let me just ask you as we get started, have you ever heard a, a piece of information that maybe you had a hard time believing was true? Have you ever had something, just something, it just it seemed like it maybe was just too outlandish that it made you doubt? Or maybe it was just too good to be true and so it kind of made you skeptical. Well, this morning I want to share some statements with you and you need to decide whether you can trust it or whether you can doubt it. Okay, whether you can trust it or whether you can doubt it. If you trust it, I want you to put your hand in the air. Everybody put your hand in the air right now. Okay, proof that you can do it right there, okay? So put your hand in the air if you trust it. If you don't trust it, put your hand down, okay? Trust, don't trust. Trust, doubt. Trust, doubt. Got it? Okay. So I'm gonna give you three statements. Let's see how you do on this. The first up, the high five is a recent innovation, in the grand scheme of history, the high five is a recent innovation. If you trust that statement, put your hand up. If you don't trust that statement, leave your hand down. So if you trust that statement, put your hand up. If you don't trust that statement, put the hand down. The high five is a recent innovation. Okay, just a few of you. Okay, all right, so here's what happens. Leave your hands up, okay? Leave your hands up. And so if you're sitting next to someone and your hand is down, I want you to give them a high five who have their hands up because they're correct, Okay. So give them a high five. Boom. There you go. Okay. The high five is relatively new. It seems like the simple gesture of one slapping one's hand in victory must have been around forever. But in truth, it's maybe even younger than many people in this room, as I know that it's even younger than I am. Right? At a pro baseball game in 1977, Dodger player Dusty Baker hits his 30th home run of the season. And as he rounded home and passed his teammate Glenn Burke on the on-deck circle, Burke raised his hand in excitement, and on instinct, Baker reached up and slapped it because he said, it seemed like the thing to do. <laughs> there you go. And thus, the official high five celebration was born right there, okay, 1977. All right, so that was the first one. Here's the second one, okay? The CIA 
once tried to create spy cats. The CIA once tried to create spy cats. If you believe it, if you, if you trust it, raise your hand. If you don't, if you doubt it, leave your hand down. Trust, doubt. The CIA once tried to create spy cats. All right, once again, if you have your hands up, you are correct. Yes. The 1960s were the peak of the Cold War era, right? And American intelligence tried some, some pretty bizarre strategies to get a leg up on the Soviets. In a project called Acoustic Kitty, no kidding, Acoustic Kitty, CIA operatives attempted to implant listening devices into the ears of cats in hopes of eavesdropping on top secret conversations. So they placed the first cat near the Soviet embassy in Washington, D.C., but according to some reports, the poor cat was almost immediately run over by a taxi. It almost, he didn't get, it didn't get tragic all of a sudden, okay? But the project was shut down in 1967 after the geniuses, and I use that word lightly, geniuses at the CIA finally figured out how difficult it is to train cats. So they, they decided we're not going to go any farther, right? All right, so hey, two for two, two trust, no doubt so far, okay? Here we go. Third statement. There was a four times over dog mayor. There was a dog that was elected mayor four consecutive times. Okay, if you believe that, raise your hand. If you don't, if you doubt it, leave your hand down. Okay, trust, doubt, trust, doubt. Some of y'all are starting to believe these things, right? Well, if you have your hand up, you are once again correct. Yes. The beloved mayor of Cormorant, a small town in Minnesota, retired after four consecutive terms in office. And as much as he loved civil service, he was getting too old for the job. He was 91 years old in dog years. He, in dog years, he was 91. Duke, the big, shaggy, great Pyrenees dog, was first elected in 2014 and continued to win yearly elections until he announced his retirement in 2018. And just what I last heard was Duke was planning to write a book about his legacy of being a very good boy. Um, but um, sadly, I don't think it ever got published. So anyways... So it's kind of easy to see why doubt has become a common occurrence for many of us within our culture today, right? There's so much false information shared on social media and, and many other places that it may cause us to doubt everything. And then we hear stories like this that just seem absolutely outlandish. But of course, we also know that there are people that we know all well, all too well in our lives who have failed us. And that causes us to doubt and I know that for many reasons, this past season of COVID-19 has, has caused many to doubt because we wonder where God is in the middle of all of this, right? Seeing a world that is full of hurt and pain can make us doubt whether God is indeed good. But people doubt for all kinds of reasons because doubt is a part of life. But hear me clearly this morning, doubts are not incompatible with the faith, right? Hear me say that. In fact, they can actually add to our faith. Selwyn Hughes says that those who doubt most and yet strive to overcome the doubts, not live in those doubts, but those who strive to overcome their doubts turn out to be some of Christ's strongest disciples. Frederick Buechner once said that doubts are the ants in the pants of faith. I love that. The ants in the pants of faith. They keep it awake and moving. Yes, doubts are a part of our life, but as Jan Martel says, to choose doubt as the philosophy of life is akin to choosing immobility as a means of transportation. It's not going to go anywhere, right? So I would argue this morning that the problem is not the doubt itself, but rather how we handle our doubt because mishandled skepticism often results in a lack of hope. So this morning, I want to tell you to take heart because we are certainly not alone in this struggle with doubt. See, after Jesus' crucifixion, his, his closest disciples and friends were heartbroken because their hopes and their dreams of a new and better world under the, the rule of God's kingdom has seemingly ended. You got to remember that even though they, they, were, they were just following Jesus and they knew Jesus the absolute best and heard everything that Jesus had, had taught and said, they were still caught up in that, that same idea of what the Messiah was supposed to be like. Just like all the rest of their countrymen and all the rest of their country women, right? They were caught up in this idea of the Messiah. The Messiah would be this, the, 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 this strong ruler that would come and, and remove the occupying Romans and usher in a new New rule, reminiscent of the glory days of King David. And just at the height of his popularity, when it seems like everything is moving in that direction, at the height of his popularity, what happens? He's arrested. He's jailed. He's put on trial. 
He's beaten. He's forced to carry a wooden heavy cross, ultimately dies on that cross. And finally, he's placed in a borrowed tomb. Those that were closest to him were devastated. And they could not wrap their their minds around what happened to Jesus, but also what could possibly happen to them as well as his followers. So they're hiding out. They're living in fear. They're living in doubt. Finally, finally, after three days of despair, everything changed, right? And it wasn't until Jesus miraculously began to show up in his resurrected form that the word started to spread among the disciples that, hey, you know what? Perhaps Jesus really is alive. He really is alive. The disciples, they just, they grabbed hold of that and their hope was restored. But, but there was one, there was one disciple. We all know who that disciple is, right? It's Thomas. Thomas refused to believe. So if you have your Bibles with you this morning, join with me in John chapter 20. John chapter 20. We're going to be coming back to John 20 throughout the morning. So I invite you just to leave your Bibles open. This morning, I'll be reading from the NIV. That's the New International Version. So once again, John 20, we're going to start at verse 24. It says this. Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the 12, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. I will not believe. Now, I'll be honest with you. I'll tell you, I think that Thomas gets a bad rap in the church. I really do. We label him as some kind of stuffy skeptic, right? He's too often viewed as a grumpy old cynic, even as a, a man with little faith. But however, if we are truthful, Thomas comes to this place of skepticism and doubt honestly, doesn't he? He really does. I mean, again, think about this. He just watched his mentor, his teacher, his friend of three years be brutally killed on a cross and buried in a grave. Now, sure, he'd either seen or he heard about Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead, but, but just the thought of this is of getting his hopes up about a resurrection that, of course, would defy all logic. It may have just been too hard for him to wrap his mind around. He was more likely to he, he was more likely to be looking to protect himself from any possibility of future pain. And this is why Thomas says that he will not believe unless he sees evidence in front of his eyes. And not just see it, but he's also got to touch it. You see, I think that if we're honest this morning, we all have been, or we are a lot like Thomas from time to time, right? The doubts that we often express is a way of, of keeping ourselves from getting our hopes up. And maybe we do that in things of our life that we think that maybe they can improve, but, but I don't know. Or, or, or maybe we struggle with, you know, can God really answer our prayers or, or that even God loves us? Those are doubts that some of us face. You see, Thomas did not want to believe that Jesus was alive because he didn't want to be let down. We often don't want to believe in hope because we're afraid that maybe God won't come through. But think about this. What's the first thing that we say when we are given any type of good news? What's the first thing that we normally say? What do we say, church? You say it out of just, you can, you go to thank God instantly? Fantastic, right? I don't, I'll be honest with you. If I hear something that seems just absolutely too good to be true, I say, no way, right? (laughs) No way. Now you've got to be kidding me, right? Or if you're from New York, get out of here, right? That's what we say. When it seems too good to be true, that's what we do. We, we, we know there's no way that this can be good news. And when we hear amazing news, many times we have to hear it again and maybe even again before it really starts to sink in. You see, I think we respond first with doubt because we want to protect ourselves from, from letting our hope get out of control, just like Thomas did. Because occasionally it takes time to let hope rise. I'll tell you, for Thomas... For Thomas, it took about a week before his hope started to rise. It was about a week since Thomas told the others that he refused to believe their reports. But it was then that he and the disciples find themselves together in a locked room once again, when suddenly the source of hope arrived. Let's pick up in verse 26 of John 20. It says, a week later, the disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, 
Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Stop doubting and believe. So without much explanation about what's going on, Jesus in the flesh shows up in this locked room with the disciples. And they must have been shocked, right? They must have been. If I was there, I would tell you I would be shocked. In fact, I'd probably be a little bit afraid, like I'd just seen a ghost or something, right? In fact, the first words of Jesus that he speaks to them are what? Peace be with you. Peace be with you. Perhaps let them know, you know what? You don't have to be afraid. You don't have to be afraid. And I love the story. I absolutely love this story because Jesus doesn't waste any time right here, does he? No, he doesn't. He has a lot to do to prepare the disciples for what is about to come, and he needs all of them to be focused and ready to go. And so what does he do? He addresses the doubt in the room by going straight to Thomas. He goes straight to Thomas. The source of hope reached out to the possessor of doubt. Did you hear that, church? The source of hope reached out to the possessor of doubt. Now, sure, Thomas was the one who refused to believe that Jesus was alive, but, but notice how he addresses him. And somebody told me in between services, and, and, and I just thought it was fantastic. Jesus didn't even ask anything about the doubt. He already knew. As soon as he arrives on the scene, he already knows that Thomas is, is filled with doubt. But Jesus does not reprimand him for his doubt. He does not belittle him for his skepticism. He doesn't ridicule him for needing proof. Now, he doesn't do any of that. Instead, what does he do? He invites Thomas to see for himself. He says, you know what? Put your fingers right here. Put them in the scars. Put your hand right here in my side. Now, I'll tell you, there are many in the community and even in the church today who are struggling with their faith, and they have lost hope that Jesus is who they thought that he was. And sometimes the response to those in the church who doubt can be less than kind and loving. But I believe, but I believe that Jesus' response would be much different. I believe that he would welcome the conversations. I believe that he would welcome the questions, that he would welcome the wrestling. And I think this is because he knows that honest doubt will find honest answers. Did you hear that, church? Honest doubt will find honest answers. And I think that if we're learning to be more like Jesus, then we need to learn how to handle those in the church who have doubts. Because let's face it, that could be any one of us at any time. It really could. I know it's been me. So how should the church respond to those who have doubts on a way that would be on par with the way that Jesus responds to Thomas? First, I'll tell you, I think the church should listen to those doubts for not really what they're, what they're saying, but probably more even so is what, the, what they're not saying. Where does that doubt come from? Where's the hurt? Where's the pain? Where's the struggle that's going on in their life? You know, many times we hear the question or we hear the doubt, but, but never the story behind it. And I know it might sound strange, but, but when I get into a conversation with people pretty much about anything, especially about their doubts with their faith, I'm instantly reminded of an iceberg. I mean, I'm reminded of an iceberg because, and you probably already know this, but the part of the iceberg that you can see only represents about 10 to 20% of the total iceberg. There's so much more that's, that's under the surface that you're never going to know. I'll tell you, I think the same is true for each and every one of us. We are so much more than what is perceived. And the truth is that you'll never get to know how deep the doubt goes if you don't take time to listen. And I will tell you, church, if you show me a congregation who is willing to listen, I will show you a church that is providing hope to the hopeless. We have to listen. Secondly, the church should empathize and express compassion. You see, empathy happens when people let themselves feel others hurt and pain and struggle. You know, it's that old saying, they don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. It's also that old saying, you know, hey, it's walking a mile in their shoes. And those are old sayings for a reason. And they keep coming up because there's truth behind them. Because when this happens, those that we pause and listen to and give our hearts to are better equipped to meet the need and to build a bridge back to faith and to hope. When I was back at Oshaleta, I had a man that I'd never met before just show up at my office door. And I, I'll tell you, my office was kind of off to the side and there was, there was a door to the office. You didn't have to go through the church to get there. 
And I would always leave the screen door open and get some breeze blowing through there. But he comes and he just knocks on my screen door and just basically comes and just lets himself in. And to say that he was upset, I tell you, he'd be putting it very mildly. He sat in the chair across from my desk. And he began to share with me the many reasons why he doubted the existence of God. And I'll tell you, I was new to the ministry at this time. I I was probably in about about a year at this point. And I had no idea what to do. So I just sat there. And I listened to him go on and on about the pain in his life for well over an hour. A lot of his doubts came from some health issues and the, the current status of his marriage. He felt as if this whole world was coming to an end and he just kept repeating the question, if there's a God, then why is all this happening to me? I go to church, I pay my tithe, you know, I I pray, why is all this happening to me? And I'll tell you, he never really gave me the chance to speak to any one of his concerns, but honestly, I don't think that's what he was there for. He just needed someone to listen. And as he was getting ready to leave, I asked if I could pray for him and he reluctantly, he said yes. Yes. So I placed my hand on his shoulder and I prayed just a very simple prayer. As I said, amen, and as I opened my eyes, I saw tears streaming from his. This man that I had never met, never met, gave me a hug. And as he turned to leave, the words that he said were, thanks for listening. Thanks for listening. And he walked out the door. Now, I could have commandeered that, that, that whole conversation, helped him see the presence of God around him. But then I began to think, if I was in his shoes and struggling the way he was, I would want someone just to listen. Just to listen. You know? I would want someone to have, show me some compassion by listening to me and praying with me personally. And I tell you, that would speak so much louder to me just as it did for him. You see, Jesus was not afraid of Thomas's doubts. And we shouldn't be afraid of other people's doubts either. If we look back on our own individual growth in the faith, we see that we all too have been, been full of doubt, right? We, we've had moments of doubt in our life and, and hopefully we're being moved into a, a being filled with hope instead. And we do that when we find people who care enough about us to listen to us, to walk with, through life with us and who are gonna love us. For Thomas, his faith was restored and his doubts squashed when he touched Jesus' hand, when he put his hand inside of Jesus' side. Once there were wounds and now there's scars. A reminder of the pain, but proof of the resurrection. But the story does not end there as Jesus has something to say. And I think he has something to say to us this morning. So let's pick up back in John 20 in verse 28. It says this, Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. And then Jesus told him, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. You see, this is all that Thomas needed, right? He recognized that if Jesus can overcome death and the grave, then he surely must be Lord and God. Disciple who was the greatest doubter now becomes the disciple who made the greatest and truest claim of who Jesus is. Now, Jesus certainly recognized Thomas's faith in this passage, but but guess whom Jesus was thinking about, even as Thomas is standing right in front of him? Who is Jesus thinking about? Who do you think Jesus is thinking about as as he's saying these words to Thomas? He's thinking about you. He's thinking about me. He's thinking about all those through the many generations who to come who would be blessed for believing in the resurrection power and divine hope without seeing. So he says, blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. See, Thomas had firsthand experience, right? Firsthand evidence that came directly from the source. And this caused his doubts to melt away. And I will tell you, the same is true for each and every one of us here today. And for those of you who are watching online, that same truth is ready for us. Our doubts can turn to hope when we too go directly to the source and we find over and over again that Jesus is trustworthy. You see, even though we may not be able to put our fingers in the nail holes or or our hands in the side like Thomas, we still have the scriptures which are full of firsthand accounts of the resurrection of Jesus. 
We have the witness of the church throughout history who has seen the power of Jesus in miraculous ways. And I'll tell you, there are testimonies in this place today. There's testimonies all around us of people who have found Jesus to be very real and personal in their lives. You see, I have many that I can share from my own life and even from my life as a minister. You see, family, when Jesus is the source of our hope, we don't have to be crippled by our doubt. We don't have to be crippled by our doubt. Even when we begin to feel our faith waver or our confidence shake, knowing Jesus helps us to press on. There's a story about Robert Louis Stevenson, one of the greatest novelists of the 20th century, who wrote of one of his excursions to the South Sea Islands. And as he was on this excursion, the ship encountered a terrible storm. And in the belly of the ship, the passengers, they began to grow frightened, and and they worried that the ship would be lost. And I'll tell you, I was on a ship just from Florida to a a Bahama Island, and we hit heavy waves, and I was in the middle. I mean, I was hunkered down thinking this was the end of it. I couldn't imagine being where they were. I'd be right there with them. See, I think that just like many of us would be, they were filled with doubts, especially doubts about their safety. But one of the men was brave, and he finally ventured out into the wind and rain. And he scurried to the upper deck where he saw the captain quietly pacing back and forth across the bridge. With a tranquil and undisturbed face, he looked out across the rough sea and he gave orders for handling the ship. And then he turned and he noticed the man that had come to check on him. And he just smiled. Just gave him a smile. The man made his way back to the cabin where the other passengers were, were all, once again, they were all huddled together, right? They're all huddled together in fear. And in response to their questions, he comforted them all by saying this. He says, I have seen the captain's face and all is well. I have seen the captain's face and all is well. Family, when we recognize that Jesus is here in the middle of our doubts, we discover that hope is here. Even in the middle of our doubts, hope is here. And for us, all we need to do is to look in the face of Christ and see, too, that all is well. Let's pray.